Stay right there in your easy chair For 30 minutes of pleasure Don't you go, it's more than the show It's the talk of the desert It's the talk of the desert with Belinda Reed I just love coming home at night I turn around, she's a treasure Now, here's Melinda. I'd have to say that a movie that hit our screens, oh, I don't even want to tell you how many years ago, about 35 years ago, um, is probably one of the biggest movies and, that everybody loves and adores, and that's The Sound of Music. And I feel so honored and so tickled that one of the main characters could be here for Talk of the Desert, and that's Liesl, or Charmian Carr. Charmian, welcome to Talk of the Desert. <laughs> Thank you. You uh, not only pronounced Liesl right, you pronounced Charmian right. <laughs> Very impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. It took me a while to get your real first name correct because I look at it and, and want to say it differently, but Charmian. You did it right. Or as I read in the book that um, they call you Charmy. Yes. Anyway, you wrote a book called Forever Liesel, mm -hmm. uh, Memoir of the Sound of Music. And um, Charmian, I'm just, like I said, I'm so tickled to have you here because everybody does love this, this movie. How did you get involved with The Sound of Music? Well, it was one of those things that I was definitely in the right place at the right time. They had actually been looking for an actress to play Liesl for months. They'd interviewed in New York, London, and L.A. and couldn't find anyone. They started rehearsals without Liesl. And my mother was in vaudeville, and an agent friend of hers knew she had three daughters and said, do you have one daughter who's over 18 who looks 16 and can sing and dance and act. They wanted an actress over 18 because they didn't want her to have to go to school on the set because the role of Lisa was larger than that of the other children and they didn't want to lose that time every day. So I went in, I met the casting agent. There was nobody there. I, I couldn't get nervous and I couldn't compare myself to anyone because there was no one there and I didn't know about The Sound of Music. I had never seen the play and I hadn't really been clamoring to be an actress. I was working and going to college and saving money to travel and I met with the casting director and he had me come back the next day and read the 16 going on 17 scene which I did and then he called me back again and I met the director and read the scene for him and then I had to come back the next day to sing 16 going on 17. And my mother and father both sang. It's just a genetic quality that I've inherited. Our Aren't whole family <laughs> sings. So I sang 16 going on 17. And then they called me back the next day. And I danced for the choreographers. And I had studied dance since the time I was four. So that was the easy part of it. And I was hired. But I was only hired temporarily. They were afraid that my eyes were too blue and would not photograph well. This was in the days before they could digitize anything. So I had to wait two weeks to have a screen test done because they had to get the stage for the screen test. But I went into rehearsals and I met everyone and I started learning the dances and started learning the songs, wondering if two weeks later I was still going to be there. <laughs> but they finally did the screen test and my eyes looked OK. They didn't look too blue. <laughs> And I got the job. You do have very blue eyes, and those are not contact lenses in there. Are there? No. <laughs> no but Charmaine, you had not really any acting experience except for your dance, your dancing before that time. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I did one play in college with my sister because they didn't have an actress to play this one role in the drama department. So she said, "Do this with me." It was called Cradle Song, and I did that one play in college. Boy, weren't you fortunate. Then, Did you have any concept when you were auditioning for the part what, the first of all, The Sound of Music was about, and second, that it would be as big as it's become? None of us did. Um, I, to this day, keep thinking, well, this year it will lose its popularity. I remember <laughs> saying that at the fifth year, at the tenth year, at the twenty-fifth year. Now we're at the thirty-fifth year. and. Um, I guess when I'm 90, I'll still be talking about The Sound of Music because The Sound of Music really spans generations, especially this past year 
since my book has come out and I've been across the country doing book signings, there are grandparents at my signings, there are parents, there are little children. They all love Sound of Music. And it's not like an old film. There's something about it that it doesn't look like an old film. No. And uh, people still love it. Well, that's for sure. Well, it's a very optimistic story, and I think that's what people really like about it. And of course, the scenery is spectacular. But what made you decide after, say, 34 years after the film uh, was first released to write a book and call it Forever Liesel? Because you will always be known <laughs> until you're 90 as Liesel. <laughs> Do you know I never really had time before? I was raising my daughters and running my in interior design business and was just very busy. Um, I had thought it might be nice to write a book and I had made some notes, but I never did. My mother always wanted to write a book. And I think something inside of me thought, well, if she wanted to write a book, I don't want to write a book. <laughs> because you have this mother-daughter <laughs> thing going on all the time. And I was approached by Jean Strauss, my co-author, and she's really the one that encouraged me to write it, and um, I'm very glad I did. We're in the process right now of writing a second book, a companion book called Letters to Liesel. I have received some beautiful letters from my book of people's experiences with The Sound of Music and uh, the happiness it has brought them. When I was working for Michael Jackson, I remember the very first month when we were working together on his house, he said to me, you know, Charmy, whenever I'm depressed, I always run The Sound of Music, and it makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I'd ever realized, goodness, how this can affect mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But it's this past year that I have heard such incredible stories, how it helps people in all phases of their life. So it's not just Michael Jackson, it's helped, <laughs> it's other people too. You're a name dropper, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm a name dropper. <laughs> no, but you, you, you've gone interior, into deterior, interior design, I'll spit the word out, <laughs> and, um, and Michael became one of your clients, as I understand from the book, because of The Sound of Music. He loved Liesel in The Sound of Music. The builder that was doing his home, I had done a home with the year before, and the builder suggested he meet me. And I met with him. And all he talked about was Liesel. Um, when he called to hire me, he said, what's your favorite song from Sound of Music? And we started having this conversation. And then he started singing to me all his favorite songs from Sound of Music. And this went on easily 15 minutes, this, this phone conversation of him singing and me singing and doing <laughs> duets. And um, he finally said, well, do you think you'd have time to decorate my house? And I said, I can certainly find the time to decorate your house. And that started a seven and a half year relationship. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it became a career practically. I mean, I never dreamed I would still be working with him, you know, mm -hmm. seven and a half years later, mm -hmm. but, but I was, and it was in the really good part. It was uh, right before Thriller came out and before Bad came out. And I went on tour with him to Philadelphia. I was like a groupie and <laughs> it was a very fascinating part of my life. I would think so. Yeah. When we talk a little bit more about Michael Jackson later in the show, we talk about your interior decorating career, but um, you know, the, the, the story of The Sound of Music was based on, on facts, but it was changed a little bit for the movie? Yes. Um, I had never met the Von Trapps other than Maria. I met Maria when we were filming Sound of Music in Salzburg, but very, very briefly. But three years ago, we were honored by the city of Salzburg, and I helped coordinate the event by getting the seven children together with the remaining Von Trapps. And I immediately, as soon as I met them, I mean, it was just like, this is, this is part of my family. I became very friendly with Maria and Agatha and um, the rest of the family and went to Stowe, Vermont. But when I was in Stowe, I learned a lot about the real history of, of the Von Trapps. The father never was mean. He always allowed singing in the house. And Maria, the governess, came only to take care of one of the children whose name happened to be Maria also because she was ill. She never came to take care of all of the children. 
And they loved their mother desperately, these seven children, and missed her, her terribly. And it was very hard for them when their father remarried. And um, then the captain and Maria, when they remarried, had three more children. So there were ten altogether. And the first child was a boy. <laughs> And they used to make fun of him all the time after Sound of Music came out, saying that he should bow and say his name was Liesl. <laughs> that he should Poor no guy. longer be Rupert, he should be Liesl. But Agatha, who is the oldest daughter, she and I are now email buddies. And then Maria, who was the daughter that the governess Maria came to take care of, she and I are good friends. We call back and forth and um, and then Werner who was Kurt's character is still alive but there's just the three of them from the original seven mm -hmm. and then the three younger children are all alive mm -hmm. but uh, it's been remarkable how they've become part of part of my family after all these years and all these years of pre portraying them to now finally meet them and be a part of them is is great the, the Von Trapp children are in their, the, currently are in their 80s, is that possible? Agatha is 87, mm -hmm. Maria is 84. I'm not exactly sure how old Werner is, but, but it, he's in his 80s yes, also. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, that's amazing. And you sh I share a wonderful story the very first time that you did meet the children. And I, I cried through that because it was, it was just, it was a really precious story. Yeah, so I encourage emotional. you to get the book too, <laughs> <laughs> to read all of these wonderful stories. Um, now, you, you filmed the movie in a couple of locations. Tell us about the locations. We were in Salzburg and we were supposed to be there six weeks. They felt we could get everything done in six weeks. Everything that you see in the film that is outside was filmed in Salzburg, except the gazebo scenes. Um, we unfortunately were there for three months because it rained so much. But even though it was raining, we still had to get up at 5.30 in the morning. Julie and I had our makeup calls together and go through makeup and hair and wardrobe, go to the set and you had to stay there for a certain number of hours. And then if it didn't stop raining, you were released back to your hotel room. And um, Christopher Plummer was never happy about that. He came in for makeup a half hour later than we did and he would always be swearing because he'd Oops. look out the window <laughs> and he'd see it would be raining and he knew we weren't going to film. And he would be so upset because the night before he would have been up till probably 2 a.m. sitting at the piano bar singing and playing and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and he and I stayed in the same hotel with some other members of the crew and he would insist we all stay there with him. So there were many late nights. Um, I was 21 and had never really drank but I had my first brandy with Christopher Plummer. Um, I think I had my first champagne, even though it says in the movie, he says, I can't have my first champagne. But he was hysterical. And when I wrote the book, he told me that I should say that he and I had a mad, passionate affair. He said that it will sell more books. And he said, and besides, I was drunk most of the time. We probably did have a mad, passionate affair. <laughs> But I couldn't put it in. <laughs> well, he, should... he said, I'll sign the release. Don't worry. You'll sell more books. You've got to put this in. <laughs> well, I think you say in the book that you were 21 at the time, and he was like 34 or something. 33. So it was not that much age difference between you. No, it wasn't like that he was 60 years old and you were 21. No. But, well, when we come back from the break for Talk of the Desert, we'll speak more with Liesel. And I feel sorry for Charmian Carr that she will always be called Liesel. But... <laughs> Probably a very positive thing in your life. It is, yes. We'll be right back with Talk of the Desert. You can always see something extraordinary that inspires you here. It captivates, thrills, and delights us. That's why the McCallum Theater is so special. Here, you can see award-winning Broadway musicals and plays, sparkling performances by the biggest stars, and all the best from the world of music, dance, and comedy. So come, join us right here at the McCallum Theater. 
Charmian Carr is as delightful and charming as she is and plays Liesl in The Sound of Music, but I'm not so sure about Christopher Plummer now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wonderful stories. And I'm sure that's what you know the audience wants to hear, those kinds of things. And that's what you've written about in the book. Mm -hmm. Share some of the other insides of things. Oh, I loved what you said about, I was it the uh, Mother Superior at the nunnery that she uh, walked across the well, you tell the story. You know what I'm talking about, I think. No, you tell the story. Well, where, you, wa <laughs> where she's walking across the garden to answer the door into the nunnery, and she's walking across it in Los Angeles, but she answers the door in Salzburg. In Salzburg. <laughs> <laughs> right. and it was wonderful. When I left the dining room scene before I meet with Rolf, I'm in Los Angeles when I leave the dining room. When I open the door to go outside and run down the steps to the lake, I'm in Salzburg. When I run from the lake over to the gazebo, I'm back in Los Angeles. <laughs> it was very confusing. Did you ever feel, see how the whole thing was going to fit together, or was it just too chopped up? We never did. The first thing that was filmed was my favorite things, and the, the graveyard, which is at the very end of the picture, was in the beginning of the picture. The last scene filmed on Sound of Music was my 16 going on 17 song and dance. But what was really confusing is when we were filming Do Re Mi, because we were all over Salzburg at all these different locations. We didn't really sing the song in order. We couldn't imagine what it was going to be like. And when we got back from Salzburg, the little children especially were really, you could tell they were tired. You know, they been gone all that time and and they were little you know and had this you know every day they had to work four hours and go to school four hours and stuff like that so Robert Wise our director put a rough cut of Do Re Mi together and showed it to all of us and we were all thrilled it was so exciting so wonderful and how we went from location to location and how it all made sense then and um, it was really kind of a thrill and I thought to myself at the time I thought this might be a good movie. <laughs> Not having any idea <laughs> really? what it would be. Really. Well, Charmin, you have also included in the book many stories of people who have shared with you how the, the movie, The Sound of Music, has affected their lives. And was there one lady, and I may, may not have the number correct, but I'm trying to remember, was it she sat through 970 showings of Sound of Music? Yes. I met her in Scotland. Sound of Music had been out. Um, two and a half years, and she'd seen it, no, not two and a half years, just two years. She'd seen it over 80 times then. And I thought that was remarkable. And I talked to her, and I said to her, not knowing about videotapes or anything like this and thinking Sound of Music was going to end soon, I said, what are you going to do when Sound of Music stops playing? And she said, I've bought the album and I'm going to listen to the songs, and she pulled out a script. She has written every line of dialogue, and she said, I will read the script, and I will listen to the music. And I said, well, what makes you so fond of this film? Why have you seen it so many times? She had never been married, and she'd never had children, and she said, if I had been married, I would have wanted it to be this way, and I would have wanted to have all of you children, and I can pretend that you are my life, really? that I have you children, and I have a wonderful husband, and I have a great belief in God and country and my ideals, and um, it was remarkable. And I mean, I didn't know that eventually she'd be able to buy a video, <laughs> and then a laser disc, and now a digital D disc, DVD. DVD. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> so um, it's remarkable. The the other thing I talk about in my book is the man that saw it so many times that when they decided to demolish the theater, he bought his seat. <laughs> That's really bizarre. He bought the seat he that he sat in. Seat. Yes bought the seat. It really touches the soul, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. the, the times that he must have seen that movie, but mm -hmm. it's just, just amazing. I have a friend who named her daughter Liesl because of the character, and um, so I imagine you get a lot of stories like that. Well, I was at a book signing this year, and this one teenager, she was about 17 or 18, handed me her book, and I always say, you know, what is your name? And mm -hmm. she said, Liesl. And I thought, oh, how nice. And then there was another teenager standing behind her. They didn't know each other. And she said to me, my name is Liesl, too. And I thought, how 
<laughs> amazing that they would be standing right really? behind each other and both named after my character. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've signed a few books for Charmians, but not a lot because Charmian is such a mouthful. <laughs> it's, it's tough to name your kid Charmian. So. <laughs> your, your mother and dad got very creative on that. They huh? did. They did, yes. <laughs> well, um, now, obviously there has been life after The Sound of Music, but you traveled all over the world promoting the, the movie too, didn't you? You know, I did and I still am. I was in Tokyo two years ago. I was in Australia three years ago. It seems whenever the studio has something to promote, they always ask me if I would go and do it. I mean, I've become the official ambassador for Sound of Music. It's It's been so much a part of my life. It wasn't just that I did this and I'm recognized. It's Lisa, but it's just all the trips all over all the years. The first two years, I was constantly going because the studio kept me under contract and they had to pay me whether I worked That's or not. <laughs> and there wasn't anything happening at Fox then. Fox was almost bankrupt because of Cleopatra hmm. and Sound of Music brought them out of bankruptcy. The only other thing they had filming was Peyton Place and they were going to put me in that, but when Robert Wise, our director, heard about it, he had a fit. He said, oh, you'll ruin my illusion of her as Liesl. You can't do that. He went to Richard Zanuck and said, please, please, please don't do that. Don't do that. So they agreed not to do that. So they just kept me traveling. And of course, that thrilled me because that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel, but I didn't really want to travel that much. I mean, <laughs> I mean part of that. <laughs> but uh, I'm used to it now. And then this past year with my book, I figured out I've probably been gone two weeks out of every month since February since the book was published. Mm -hmm. Meeting people and doing book signings and doing publicity and I don't know if you know about the sing-alonga, but now I'm involved with the sing-alonga. It's like the Rocky Horror Show, okay. but they're doing it with Sound of Music. It started in London a year and a half ago. This producer got a copy from 20th Century Fox and he was going to show it for two nights, a Friday night and a Saturday night on a weekend. And it packed the theater. It is still running in London. I was there last month. It still is packed. <laughs> they want you to dress up as characters from Sound of Music. Okay. And you go in with your costume on and they have a big costume contest and if you win you get prizes but when you go in you're given a little bag and in the bag it's a piece of fabric so that when Julie is all upset about not having play clothes for the children and she's singing my favorite things after the captain leaves you're supposed to take your little piece of fabric and wave it in the air and yell the curtains Julie the curtains the curtains <laughs> and they ah. give you a little sprig of Edelweiss and when they're singing Edelweiss you have to spray the Edelweiss back and forth <laughs> and there's an MC in the beginning and when they sing Do Re Mi he teaches the audience the choreography and Do it's Do a deer a female deer <laughs> Ray a drop of golden sun me a name I it's a whole choreographed number that they teach the audience and when we sing it I'll be darned if that audience doesn't do this and when I was in the premiere in New York there was one guy that had it down so well that the part in Do Re Mi where we go Do Mi 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 So So Re Fa Fa La Ti Ti he's doing this whole thing Do Mi Mi Re So So perfectly <laughs> so fast I was so impressed but it is the most hysterical thing uh, that, they talk back to the screen <laughs> they boo and hiss the Nazis they cheer on the family when I was in Austin for a showing of it they had a benefit for AIDS and there were three people behind me that had basically a script so that they had certain lines that they would say before the character said the lines. And in that very lovely scene where Christopher and Julie decide they'll be married and it's in the gazebo and it's in profile and she makes a reference to the Reverend Mother and he touches her lip very lovingly and said, and what else does the Reverend Mother say? There's a beat before he says his line and they stood up and yelled, get the booger, Captain. <laughs> This goes on through the entire film. Christopher Plummer has never liked The Sound of Music, but I know that if he goes to the sing along he will love The Sound of Music. <laughs> but it is absolutely hysterical, and I'll be going across the country selling my book at it as well as oh. being there, and I sing for them at the intermission and help 
judge the costume. And they're not only just coming as characters from the film, they're now coming as lyrics from the film. <laughs> the creativity is wonderful. Oh, Charmian, this is just wild. And I'm sure back in 1965, you had no concept that this would ever take place of something like this. None. <laughs> Do you know, we only have about three minutes left. And um, I think our audience would like to know about your children and that you're a grandmama. Yes. I have this little granddaughter named Emma who's 20 months old. And the sun rises and sets in her. And I'm sure she's just the most wonderful granddaughter in the world. But I know that everyone's granddaughter is loved like my granddaughter is loved by me because I would always hear people say, wait till you're a grandmother. And I never understood it until I was a grandmother. And then I have two married daughters who I'm really proud of, who have wonderful husbands and wonderful jobs. And uh, That's, that's just marvelous. Yeah. Well, Charmian, you say in the book that um, you got married and that you sort of stopped your acting career, although you did some, some uh, commercials, commercials and things. Mm -hmm. And that, can, that kept you at home with, with the babies. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. Yes. Mothering is the toughest, yeah. best job in the world. The, absolutely. And the hardest. Yeah. And the hardest. Mm -hmm. OK, we've got two months left. Let's talk about your interior decorating business. Now, OK, it said name dropper Michael Jackson. But you've helped him with his home now, you said, what, seven and a half years? Seven and a half years. That's yes. pretty amazing. Yes. The most amazing part, if I can quickly get this out, yes. is he didn't want any furniture in the bedroom. He wanted mannequins. So there are 17 mannequins <laughs> in Michael's bedroom. Um, why? I'm not sure to this day. Uh, but um, he's got his mannequins. He's got a party in his bedroom. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. So you, you work with other clients um, in Southern California then? I work all over. Mm -hmm. Do you? And yes. do you have a specialized uh, uh, theme that, or style that you like to specialize in? Not particularly. I create a feeling. And whether it's contemporary, whether it's country, whether it's formal, I want to create a feeling that when someone walks in a home that I've done, that they feel comfortable, that they want to sit down, and that they want to stay there. It's not a look. It's a feeling. I don't want any of my homes to look decorated. Well, Charmian, you're in town um, at a book signing at the Children's Discovery Museum. It took place a, a couple of weeks ago. But um, anyway, thank you so much for your time uh, coming and joining me on Talk of the Desert and for sharing a, a, a little bit about Charmian and a lot about Liesel. And it, just, it was a spectacular movie. And you've got to be so proud that you were a part of something that affected so many people's lives in such a positive way. Most definitely I am. Yes. Thank you, Melinda. Well, thank you, Liesel Charmian Carr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never will live down your name, the, no. the character name, will <laughs> it's okay, you? okay, though. Thank you for joining me on Talk of the Desert. You're welcome. Thank you, audience, for joining us. For more information, email TOTDTV at questoffice.net and visit talkofthedesert.tv on the web.